I'm okay being a failure. I'm okay being a loser. Because if you haven't failed and you haven't lost, you can't win. The pain of the loss is so deliciously painful that it makes it to where you will not do it again. Go lose. Go fail. It's okay. Hey, what's up, MU fam? Welcome back to another episode of the Millionaire University Podcast. Brian Guerin back with you today. And I'm speaking with Preston Brown. He's a speaker, serial entrepreneur, disruptive innovator, and honestly, pretty inspiring as well. We're going to be talking about three of the biggest things that a lot of folks are worried about when it comes to trying or wanting or actually becoming an entrepreneur, and that being not having time, talent, or cash to start a business, and how really that's a myth. So without further ado, I want to bring in Preston. Let's dive right in, and I'll see you on the other side. Just from the few minutes before our call here, man, I've, I'm fired up already. You've got that energy that is just uh, infectious, so I love it. So Preston, welcome to the show, man. Thanks for saying that, man. The one thing we'll all buy in a can or take anywhere we can get it from is energy, right? So you know, if you're going to go into be becoming a student of how to become an entrepreneur, how to go get rich, how to get your dreams. You better have the energy necessary to consume the content and then put it into action afterwards. I know I'm I'm in my 30s. That's kind of how it was. You know, if you're going to start a business, well, you better have time, better have a ton of talent, you better have a lot of cash. And Preston, I think we're going to talk about how that just isn't the case today. You know, I think anytime in life, if you're believing lies, or your results are going to suck. So Almost every entrepreneur that I've ever had the opportunity to work with, and they're, they're all looking for, for more time, more talent, more money for one reason or another in whatever various stage of business that they're in. And, and they're all failing when they're searching for those things. But that's true of anything, right? If you're believing a lie, like anybody ever heard, oh, the customer's always right. If the customer was right, you would sell the product for free and you'd have a warranty forever. Maybe the customer's not so right. Maybe the customer should be more right than your competitor's customer, but it doesn't sound as sexy, so we don't say it. So yeah, let's dive in. Time, talent, cash. Let's go into the lies that everybody believes. When we say you don't need time, talent, or cash, when we're talking about time, I can't tell you how often I hear that I simply don't have the time to become an entrepreneur. What do you say to that? I say that's true. You're not going to be an entrepreneur. And, and by the way, it's true for everybody that's ever said that, but it's not true for any entrepreneur. I'm going to just maybe go a little bit into the spiritual side of things here. If God made us in his image, he made us creators, not slaves, not earners. And it goes... In the good book, it says, be fruitful and multiply. It doesn't say, hey, you need to go get a job and do time management, this, that, and the other. You got to create time, okay? Like business is not about time. It's not about talent. It's not about cash. It's about an idea you have that is better than the idea that somebody else had. It's about an idea. And you don't start a business by quitting your job. And normally, unless you've spent many years saving and done this and that and the other, which is not the normal way that most people start. And it can happen, but it's the exception, not the rule. You start in your extra time, which for most of us doesn't really exist. We have to make it. We have to sleep a little less. We have to eat meals faster. We have to spend less time on the potty. We have to spend less time on Facebook or social media. We have to be more efficient at work. You can create extra time. You and everyone else on the planet is equal in one way, 24 hours a day. Everybody has unique advantages, unique and disadvantages in life. But one thing we all do truly have equal is time. And Almost every self-made entrepreneur I've ever met has found a way to create time. Sometimes a business starts in 30 minutes a day, 30, 45 minutes a day, which maybe you used to watch Netflix on. And almost anyone I've ever met that has told me, hey, I don't have enough time. Okay. Do you know how you measure love? Here's a simple way to measure love. Okay. You measure love through this thing called suffering. That's why it's called unconditional love because you love somebody enough that you love them beyond even your own conditions and expectations for them. Well, what happens if, oh, you know, I, I spend time with my wife and kids in the evenings. Okay, well, do you love them enough to go create a business that's going to set them free generationally? Yeah, take 30 minutes for the next few years that you would have put there and start something. And if you love yourself enough to go out and create that, you're going to have to suffer somewhere. You're going to have to take from something. There is nothing for free. There's a price, but the price is worth it. It's a bargain. You can't create time without knowing that you have to make that sacrifice. And I can relate to that myself as an entrepreneur. Like there are, I can't tell you how many times I've been up at 2 a.m. getting work done while my three kids are sleeping. Like it's, it's time that has to be 
forged from your calendar. It's there. You just have to make the sacrifices to do it. And it's a conscious decision. I was telling one of my buddies this the other day. It was a choice that you make. And I love the way you put it. You have to love yourself and love your family enough to say, hey, I'm going to go design this thing and we're going to nail it the way it's going to be nailed. But I have to have that time to get it done. Everyone I've ever heard say that excuse specifically when I've spent a day with them. I'm like, cool, let's spend a day together. And they don't realize when I say let's spend a day together, then a whole day. Like, when do you wake up in the morning? And I'll show up an hour early. I don't do this anymore, but this is how I started my coaching. I showed up an hour early. I'm like, great, I'm here. And you kind of say, what, what, what do you mean you're here? Well, yeah, I'm here early. Are you going to let me in? Then you see how their get up routine is. You see what they're going to do with their coffee. Like, then I'm leaving as late as possible. I'm leaving when you're throwing me out. I want to see well, what, what's this. What's, what are you normally doing this time? And I'm asking your wife. I'm asking your kids. Like, oh, is there more Netflix? Is there more? Okay, I'm going to find it. Everyone has had something to cut out, right? Everyone has. I've never found anyone that couldn't cut something. There's no human being that efficient. Well, I'd love to weave in a little bit of your story here. So when you said you used to go out, it sounds like this was part of maybe a coaching program or a mentorship program where you're showing up at a CEO door and literally running through their day with them to help them improve it. <laughs> That's probably an understatement, I'm sure. But tell us a little bit about that. I built a company called Your Best Life, and we had all the millionaires and a few billionaires in the group that traveled the world. We did the coaching program. But no, this is even before that. One of my earlier businesses was a real estate brokerage. And I used to hear this, like realtors are just like entrepreneurs or want to be entrepreneurs, depending on their level of success. And I would hear all the time, I don't have time. I don't have time. And I'm like, how do you not have time? You don't even have a job. So I would show up and we'd do things called ride-alongs. At that point in time, I wanted them selling the homes. I wanted them getting the listings. I wanted them working with the buyers. Like I knew that unless they were productive, I, as the owner of the brokerage, wasn't going to make any money. So I had to figure out what were the real problems. And, and time was never one of them. It was where they were putting their time. Awesome. Going from time and into talent, I know that it's one of the, at least to me, it's one of the misconceptions that you have to be a brainiac, a genius. You've got to know how to create something new and different that nobody's ever seen before. What do you? What is your opinion on the talent side of this when people use the excuse of, I don't have the talent to do that. I don't have the skill. It's another lie. And anytime you believe anything that's untrue, you're going to suffer. And not for a loving reason, for an unloving reason. Like you even think about the word belief, right? Belief comes from the word, root words of be love. So when you're believing lies, you're being loving towards the wrong thing, not truth, it's lies. But talent's interesting because talent's built. Nobody started knowing how to drive a car. Nobody started knowing how to like get dressed. Every single one of us started having to wear diapers or something like that, right? Like we, nobody came out of the womb like these amazing 30, 40, 50 year old human beings that were so articulate and, and, and incredible. We had to build those talents. Like repetition is the mother of all skill. I went to a Tony Robbins conference, many of them a while back, and, and he made a really fun joke and it's worth repeating. And he says, nobody goes to a baby that's trying to learn how to walk and screams at him and yells at him. Ah, oh, you're just not a walker. Look, you fell down twice, you idiot. Nobody does that, right? There's some falling involved in walking and eventually you build that talent. We don't think about it now, but talent is something built. You don't start with a talent. In fact, normally, if you're that startup business, you're not gonna have the talent. No startup business is gonna have the talent of the guy that's been in it 20, 30 years. But you know what you're gonna have? You're going to have a passion. You're going to have that vibrance. You're going to have that fire as that new guy getting in. You're going to, you have less customers. So you have more time to give them more service. Of course you don't have the talent. Exactly. Was that, so when you were starting to build your empire, what, what were the steps you took to jump into that headlong? One, one thing that maybe I'm a little bit masochistic in this way, emotionally, at a very young age, I started having some different problems and different things that, that happened in my family's life and later my life. And people can find that on my story all over social media, whatever. But I got this sort of identity around, wow, right on the other side of that problem, there's generally a gift. You know, that, that came when, to give you a, the very short version of a longer, more fun story, my dad got cheated. He wanted the life we saw on TV, not the one we lived. And that guy that cheated him, like, basically burnt his goals and dreams. He quit his entrepreneurial Chase and went and got a job, worked that for the rest of his life. Of course, I turned into a miserable, angry guy that if you thought Donald Trump was too tough, I was the you're fired guy that would make him look like a sweetheart. And I turned very corporate, very toxic, this, that, and the other, eventually lost dad in 2019 and realized I spent my whole life healing his wound and didn't spend time with the guy that was my hero. And, and there's longer versions of that story everywhere, but 
But through the processes, every time I'd get a problem, I'd go chase it. And and if you study a problem, you learn more about it. Like you're generally going to know more about that problem than the next guy who also promises to solve that problem. If you take that to the entrepreneurial world, the, you can build a better mousetrap, as they say. And right on the other side of the problem is the gift. Most people I've met, in fact, all people I've met, I can't say most, it's all people I've met, their greatest strength and their greatest weakness comes from the exact same source. Yet we don't have the courage to step in and look at what that source is. I had daddy issues and daddy got cheated. So I went and built a business. My greatest weakness was those daddy issues from that circumstance when I was young. That translated into I became a money grubbing jerk. Okay. I was, I, there's not a four letter word I haven't been called and there's not a four letter word that hasn't been true in, in some of the ways I behaved when I was building my empire. Now, what's funny is when I lost dad, I refocused around love as the meaning of life, started studying other things and my wealth went exponentially higher, but none of it was ever around talent. It was around this love of problems. Like religion is, is this rule set, right? Let's go into a fun analogy. Religion is a great way to avoid hell spirituality and I'm, I'm, I'm Christian. I, I believe in Christ and God and all that, but I, I like to bring the spirituality side to it because if religion's a great way of avoiding hell, then I think spirituality is going there, conquering the place and coming back victorious. And when you can go in and you can say, hey, I'm not going to just follow this rule structure written by these men 3000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, whatever, I'm going to go in and I'm going to learn myself and I'm going to study this. I'm going to build a better mousetrap around my industry, my business, whether it's home building, real estate, lollipop manufacturing, whatever you're into. And I'm going to sell my products to customers in a better way, produce my products in a better way. I'm going to build that better mousetrap. My sale is their solution to their problem. And so when you realize your problems are your gifts, you become that entrepreneur because now you're doing what the market needs, which is solving problems and providing value. People that get into, and this is actually a really good segue to go into the other one, cash. People get into business because they're all about like money. Oh, I want to get into business to be rich. You're never going to work. Or I, all the people asking on my social media, hey, can I have a loan? Hey, can I have a job? Hey, what, how do I raise money for my business? These are three of the most common questions I get. And I, I think it's sad. If you're going to raise money for your idea that you haven't proved works, or at least if it's a common idea, you haven't proved works for you, why would I give you money? There's no way. Like there's, if, it, if it's a common idea, I can go on the stock market, find the same idea, and invest with a company that has trended success with no risk or very little risk. If, if it's an uncommon idea, I'm not going to give you money. Go make the idea work. If you can't make an idea work without money, how the heck are you going to make it work with my money when you have no risk? Nobody worries about losing my money. They worry about losing their own. What, what are you going to lose? What are you going to lose? So the, other, the other side is when you're kind of looking the time, the talent, the cash. Businesses are about creating value. They're about creating revenue. They're about creating something. So if you got in for the money and not for the passion, not for the purpose, not for solving the problem that you solve, like, if I build a home, like in one of my larger companies is a home building company, I get really excited when I see the family excited about their new home. When there's that Facebook post of, look what's done. They, I mean, they don't know I'm involved in it and they don't need to. I know that their life is going to be touched by something I did. Now, if I'm good at that business, I'm also going to make a hell of a margin and sell it at a market price, maybe even a little better than a market price. I get rewarded for solving their problem. But I'm passionate about the solution to the problem. The money I'm receiving is an effect. It's not the reason I should be there. If you're in for the money, you should get out now because you're going to screw up your industry. Solve the problem and the money will come. Absolutely. It's effect, not cause. Cash flow is king in a business. Without cash, without sales, you don't have a business. But I think it's a huge mindset barrier when somebody is looking to start a business. Maybe you're stuck at a nine to five or maybe you're coming up through high school and you're not sure if college is right for you, but you really are interested in this entrepreneurship thing. You're like, shoot, I don't have any money to start anything. It's a matter of using your brain power and go proving something. So it's never true. You don't have the money to start the thing you want to start. You do have the money to start something. Okay. Like I give you some of my first businesses. All right. My first business, I think I was, uh, well, no, my first business, I was stealing lemon juice packets from Grandy's, a little like fried chicken place. And I would sell them at school for 10 cents each. Eventually I had to go buy them because the manager caught me, but <laughs> I don't recommend that approach. But my second business, probably more reasonable. I was in maybe middle school, maybe early high school, maybe both. My, my parents kept telling me to get a job. Okay. 
And I, I needed money. I wanted money. And I went out and I got stencils. I got masking tape and I got paint. And I walked around and full disclosure, I lied to people. And I told them, yeah, I'll paint the house numbers on your driveway. This is before GPS and all that. And, uh, you know, that way the ambulance can find you and the set and the other and it's all for charity. So I lied to them about it being for charity. But it was true that if the house numbers were on the curbs on your driveway, then they were standardized and it was easier for people to find your house. So that part was true. And I would sell those for five to 10 bucks a driveway. Go do a hundred driveways in a weekend. And it doesn't take that long, especially if you get two guys, and you pay them 50 bucks each, which is a lot of money for them. And all of a sudden you're getting 500 to a thousand dollars in two days. So my parents, they were like, Oh, you got to get a job. You got to get a job, which in a job, what do you need? You need time. You need talent. And there's the resources of the job. So the, the, the money, if there were, right. Th those are the things. If you're chasing a job, you need that confidence. Okay. And so I went and got a job at Peter Piper Pizza, and it was so funny. I worked like a dog. It was like slave driving. I was cleaning up toilets. I was cleaning up pizza grease everywhere. It was horrible. And I got done with my week, and I'm like, after taxes, $180 on my check. And I was like, I put in 40 hours. I put in 20 hours painting driveways. Now, the business you're trying to start when you're calling me or messaging me on Instagram and saying, hey, can you loan me a million dollars? I want to start this high-end exotic car leasing company, cool, or whatever. That's the most recent one that I got this morning. That, that's the business you want. You know, it's funny. You go paint driveways right now, probably make two grand a weekend. That's eight grand a month. That's the business you can start. And that eight grand a month, what if you did it seven days a week, maybe turns into 15 grand a month. Maybe you add some landscaping services at this. You can get into business without money. Okay. And then when you take that money and you reinvest it into something, that's when you get into the sexy businesses, the ones you want, the ones that everybody's like, oh, wow, that's great. But, but your expectation, not yours specifically, Brian, but like a lot of people, their expectation is I have to start selling airplanes. Okay. Have you ever owned an airplane? How many times have you been on an airplane? Maybe you should start painting driveways. You've owned a driveway or you've been on a driveway. Start there. Yep. That's so pertinent. I was just talking to my web developer last week and he was, we were conversing about smaller business owners that need websites. It's, we run into a lot of folks that are, they're wanting the big business. Oh, I need all this stuff on this website. Got to be able to do this, got to be able to do that. And our point to them is, no, you really don't need that. Based on what you've told us, you need to start small. Go win this small business and start scaling up. You don't need this massive backend software package that you think you do. Because you told us you only have four clients and they're all really tiny. You want to serve the million dollar clients, but you haven't even served the thousand dollar ones yet. And exactly. it's, yeah, it's, but it's easy to get caught up in that and thinking that, oh, I've got to go be the executive jet company owner. Well, sure. You can get there, but you have to start somewhere. I, I think Bill Gates said this and there's mixed reviews on, on, on him as a person, but it was brilliant advice. Everybody overestimates a year, but they underestimate a decade. Okay. Like I have companies now, single companies that are doing a hundred million in revenue. 10 years ago, I was living in a little house on Bishop Flores street in El Paso. I think all of 1100 square feet. And I just bought the house. Maybe this is 12, but whatever, like roughly 10 years ago. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, like my wife and I, we own two airplanes. We own multiple vacation homes, boats. And we're like, wow, that's 10 years. That's, this is crazy. Everybody looks at a business and they're like, oh man, <laughs> get rich quick scheme, another pyramid scheme, another this, another that. Oh yeah, no, you go chase it for a good 10 years. And I worked my ass off in 10 years, Brian. It's not like I didn't work. I still work 40, 60, 70 hours a week, but I'm doing the work I want to do. I have no boss. I have the greatest vacations ever. I get to spend time with my kids. I can turn off work at any point. I can hire all the right people. But it, it, it's funny that people, they'll go work a job for 40 years, not understanding the economics of what that means, get a retirement that won't keep up with inflation. But then they'll look at me and they'll say, oh, that's too much risk. Well, let me tell you about risk, because this is funny. Let's look at economics. Right now, the median income in America is right around 70 grand a year. That's for a family. To own a home, the median home in America, it would need to be $120,000, which means you're $50,000 too low on the median income in this country if you go out and trust the government, do what they say, and get a job to just getting the basic, most foundational American dream of home ownership. Who are you listening to? You think it's high risk being in business? Oh, you might fail? Okay, cool. I'm okay being a failure. I'm okay having been a loser. 
You need to lose a few times. You need to fail a few times. I'm no longer painting driveways. I failed in that business. I shut it down. What if I'd have gone a different direction and focused on time, talent, and cash as needs for a business? Instead of focusing on what's my biggest problem, how do I solve that? I'm okay being a failure. I'm okay being a loser. Because if you haven't failed and you haven't lost, you can't win. The pain of the loss is so deliciously painful that it makes it to where you will not do it again. Go lose. Go fail. It's okay. I love that. I love that. I, through my own entrepreneurial journey, I've definitely been the loser. That's for darn sure, multiple times. And I, I appreciate you sharing that message because you might lose, but you put in a heck of an effort and you built something, even if it's small, something is now built. Even if it's just in your mind, something is built. And now you can start building upon that and get that snowball effect over time. But if you never take the risk, now the loss is going to be in what you could have done or what you may have always wanted and you likely could have. But it's a matter of taking that jump, or, you know, having that confidence in yourself and knowing that the alternative is just lying back. And like you said, just look at the economics. They don't make sense at all. The driveway business, you said it failed. What was your next step? I'm very interested in your middle steps to getting from where you are now, living the executive life from where you started painting driveways. What was your next step on that one? You know, I, I failed the driveway business. You know, I, I got sold on, you need to join the military because I grew up in the traditional middle-class family, like good folks. We started poor. My parents got jobs. They made enough money and we got to middle class. And then I joined the military because they couldn't afford to pay for college for all their kids. I dove in. So I could go to college because that was a need. You need to go get an education. Frankly, most people will get more of an education listening to your podcast than they will in college. Okay. That's called indoctrination. They're teaching you how to be employed. They're teaching you how to be a slave. They're teaching you how to do what's exactly the opposite of what's in the good book. I made you in my image. Well, that wasn't to go get a job from somebody that doesn't give a about you. That was to go create something, to go be fruitful and multiply. And so I went and I joined the military and I failed that business because I was actually making more doing that than I was in the military. And in the military, of course, I realized how broke I was. So I joined Amway, and which was at that point called Quickstar and Pyramid Scheme, quote unquote. But I got a great education out of it. Lots of tapes, lots of books, lots of CDs. Never made it big in that business, although I am so grateful I was in it because I may not be here today if it wasn't for their silly education system. It was funny. They sold us like five, 10 bucks a week or something. And I got tapes and books and CDs and all these things that made me believe I could. So I started feeding my mind. From there, that business failed and I started flipping homes. I made like 30 grand with no work. So immediately thought I was a genius. So the talent thing. And then I went and did three more overnight. And I lost more than I made on the first one. So I wasn't a genius. But I loved problems. Thank God that one little piece was there. Like, I love problems. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to go become a real estate agent. And I went, got my real estate license, worked for this home flipper that had a brokerage. And eventually he, God rest his soul, like didn't appreciate me going back into home flipping. And so I had to leave. And then I went out and became the largest home flipper wholesaler in my market. I eventually kept properties because it was better for taxes. And then I eventually realized, oh, wow, if I become a builder, I can flip a hundred homes in the same neighborhood. My gosh, that would be so efficient to not have to like peel back layers of an onion only to find out this, that, and the other. I could just literally build them all from the ground up, same checklist. Wow, that'd be so easy. And so, you know, I went and worked for a builder as a real estate broker and eventually bought him out and just kept adding companies. Like, so everything just stacked at every stage before I advanced to the next stage, I was worried about three things. How do I get the time, the talent, the cash to go to the next stage? And every stage, those were the things, the very things I should not have worried about. Those were the things that did not matter because the talent grew when I studied the problems and went and solved them at a higher level. I created time by sacrificing that something that was previously not important. Like I watch net Netflix maybe an hour a week, maybe. I know people that watch that four hours a day. I, I used to watch a lot of shows and that's my way of enjoying myself. So I, I don't knock it, but if you want to build a business, if you're doing three or four hours a day of that crap, it's stupid. So I found time. It was funny because talent improved as I kept doing it. And then the cash came as a result of the business, not beforehand. And if you're a small business and you can build trust, a lot of times, and this is just a secret that people don't realize, you can get the cash in almost every industry before you even close on the sale. Like a lot of people in business will put a deposit down. Guess what? 
if your margins are good enough and your sales process is good enough and everything like that, say like, oh, I'll give you a fun business. I couldn't get a good pool servicer. So I decided I'm a business expert. I'll just open one. It'll do it. And so, you know, we've got 50, 150 clients in there that we work with and, and we replace their furnaces, this, that, and the other. And, and sometimes they don't have the money for the furnace. Well, the furnace itself costs two grand and I already have the guys employed. So I haven't put two grand down and I sell them the furnace at market price of five grand. Well, the two grand paid for the work. You know why? Because when I called the distributor that sold me the furnace, I had a pre-structured account. The employee was already in. Or if I was a startup, I would have been the employee if that was my skill set. And so I'd say, hey, dude, I need a furnace. He'd give me a furnace. I'd install it. I had a two grand deposit. Guess what? By the time we're done, he's going to pay me three more. It cost me two in my time. So I made what? You see how that works? You can actually, if you have a good sales and marketing process, get the money before you're even done with the work. Now, you got to be very careful because you can burn your reputation if you don't manage it well. But uh, one example. That is a perfect example because, and like you said, you got to make sure you have your ducks in a row before you're able to do that. But it, it, there's no way that it should be uh, a barrier to you conducting business when there are ways around that. So I think that's a perfect example. It sounds like everything that goes into the process of building, buying, and acquiring a new home, did all of your businesses from, hey, I'm going to start the home building. We're going to literally put sticks in the ground, foundations, and build it upwards to, okay, now the next problem that our clients face is lending. Is that how that worked on your end? Lending's really easy. There's more money in the world than there is deals or talent. And so if you prove that you can do something, people will loan you the money to do it. I'll give you an example. Say it costs 250000 with a lot in the construction to build a home. Maybe three hundred if you're ta- if you're a larger builder and you have four men and office costs and all that. We're going to sell that home for three fifty at the end of the day after closing costs, commissions, all that, and say there's fifty grand left over. If it's going to take you six months to do it, then you can replace that twice a year. And guess what? If three hundred turns into three fifty twice a year, and you only needed to borrow two fifty or three hundred to do it, what's the cost of the money? For you, it might be eight percent, nine percent, even in today's market. So you're paying 8%, but you're making what percent return? 33? So your real return is 25? Okay. Like, it'd be stupid not to do that. So lending's easy. Loans are designed for scaling, not for starting. There's nothing wrong with scaling, but lenders are not stupid enough to give you money before you start. They're smart enough to give you money when you're proven. And then when you do well, they'll give you more money. Period. They need to give you more money. They make loans to successful, optimized, organized business structures. I've I've generally found if you're smarter than me, I want to hear from you. And if you're not smarter than me, I don't really pay attention to what you say. And and everybody's smarter than me in something. So I try to, when I meet a person, I'm like, okay, where's this person great? And where do they suck? Everybody likes to talk about everything. So I try to guide the conversation to where I see they have success. And when they go into the things they suck at, I don't really care about their opinions because they're not backed by, like, what's the biblical reference? Measure a tree by its fruit. Well, everybody has fruit. Just find the fruit, right? And so you guide the conversations to the great stuff. So I was dealing with this really successful guy, and he was like, man, if you want to be in business, you should be in real estate. I think I was in the Amway business at that point, and he was talking to me because I was in the Amway business. He didn't like me hustling him. Do you have a dream? Um, (laughs) Let me show you the plan. (laughs) Let me get my flip book. And I was like, why real estate? And he had success in real estate. So I listened. He was like, look, dude, our forefathers set up real estate so that it was going to have the best tax circumstance ever. And I was like, oh, wow. Okay, cool. That makes sense. They did. Real estate is one of the few tax shelters, real estate and like insurance. And so I was like, okay, cool. So a bunch of landowners created a country, arranged the tax codes around their best interests since they were landowners. Check. Okay. Liked that one. And then he was like, okay. And then there's three people that get wealthy in the world. And I was like, who's that? And this is before COVID. It's before 08 and all that. And he said, bankers, doctors, or medical professionals, he said, and salespeople and real estate, guess what? Ding, ding, you're selling products that are expensive. So if you're gonna be in sales, do you wanna sell soap, what Amway's telling you to sell? Or do you wanna sell buildings, houses, land? And, and it's a much larger thing. And I was like, whoa, okay, well now it's not one check, now it's two checks. And then he says, look, if you're gonna invest in something, You want to invest in something that's hitting as many quadrants of our global economy as you can. What's our global economy made up of? Human capital. We need people to make stuff. Mineral wealth. You need oil, minerals, all these things to produce things. Technology. Okay. And real estate. But real estate, if you're not technologically advanced, you have three of the four. 
If you are technologically advanced and you're on some of the pioneering ends, which we happen to be, we're very lucky to have a tech department where we have more tech employees than we have employees in any other company except the home building company. And so we've built some crazy new technologies. People don't understand technology either, by the way. Let me explain technology because it doesn't just have to be like softwares or tech. Technology can be the wheel with technology. Technology can be a process that you do something better. That's a different technology. You can create a better technology than everybody in your industry by having an Excel sheet that makes you more efficient. All you have to do to be the best in technology is be ahead of the other guys in your game, okay? And so if you hit all four, those are the four main quadrants of society and you will be rich. He said, anything that you're in more than two of, if you're in three or more, you will be rich. If you get into four, you will be super rich. You will create generational wealth. You will support the things that you care about, whether it's saving women and children from sex trafficking, whether it's this, that, or the other, whatever you care about, you will be able to invest in because every talks a big game. You know what we need more of? People that can give a big game. Instead of people telling you their income goals, the people you're going to start respecting are the people that tell you their giving goals. I love when people are like, I want to give a million dollars. I want to give $2 million. I want to know your giving goals. If I hear your income goals, I know you're still trying to meet your needs. If I hear your giving goals, I know your needs are met. And now it's just like, how do I make the world a better place? It's only going to happen in business. You can't get a job that gets you there. I think you hit the nail on the head there. It's got to be something that you develop or that you, the life that you build for yourself so you can go from covering your needs to covering that of whatever it is. I think that's an awesome analogy to draw with that for sure. Uh, well, Preston, I want to make sure I respect your time here. I think we could go all day, but I got to start uh, bringing the plane down to the, the runway here. What's one piece of advice? You've already dropped a thousand on us here today, but for one piece of advice for our listeners of if you're just sitting here and you're thinking like, I've got an idea, I want to run with it, but it's one of these three things, time, talent, or cash that is bugging you. What is the very most important thing that you can do today to try and solve that issue for yourself? You know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go a little more broad because I think we've hit time, talent, and cash. I'm going to give you just a piece of advice that... that one of them that has radically changed my life, radically. And, and if you follow just this advice, you'll become really successful in whatever you're looking for. You need to learn the meaning of words, okay? The meaning of words matters. And we live in a society where people are changing the meaning of words. And I'm going to go into one word since we're in the millionaire university that I think is radically important. So while you should learn the meaning of all words that were relevant to you, this word is critical. What does ownership mean? And people think ownership gets them possession. And we don't live in a time where that's true anymore or may not have ever been true. Ownership gets you responsibility. Responsibility gets you possession. People go out and say, oh, I wanna open a business, but we live in an age where powerlessness has become power. And if you wanna influence somebody, you gotta act like a victim. And so we're avoiding responsibility. Well, there's all sorts of abilities that are, that are important, like availability is up there, but responsibility might be the most important ability. Ownership begets responsibility. Responsibility begets possession. If you truly want to possess something, you must be responsible for it. And that is when you will truly have it on it. And if you will not learn the definition of that word, then everything around you will possess you and you will not possess it. Wow. wow. I like that one. That is per I think that, that is the perfect place to end this. Man, you listeners out there, go ponder that one. That's a deep one. All right, Preston, I want to thank you so much for joining us. How can our listeners check you out? Sounds like you're all over the social medias. How can they reach out to you? Where can they learn more about Preston Brown? They can go to any of my social medias. It's the Preston Brown, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, all of them. And then uh, just a free gift for all of your listeners. I teach business automation. I have a free masterclass. There's all sorts of courses you can buy. Honestly, they'll help accelerate you and they're great, but you don't need them. The masterclass is the magic. I don't care how much money you have or don't have. Go to automateyou.com. Automateyou.com, there's a free masterclass. I go over the seven stages of entrepreneurship and a problem-solving formula where you can turn your problems into your gifts and every single person out there can be rich, wild, and free and have the life they watch on TV instead of the one they're living now. All right, man, that was some, some high-energy killer information, in my opinion, that is tailored towards just getting us to do the thing. We have these dreams. We have these uh, notions of becoming an entrepreneur, or maybe we are an entrepreneur and we're still young in the journey, but we want to get better. We want to improve. Preston coming in with the hot-hitting knowledge to really drive home the point that it can be done. 
with the confidence in yourself, with the ability to know yourself and have that self-discipline and self-awareness, the sky's the limit, honestly. Thank you very much to Preston for joining us. Uh, had a blast. And folks, we'd love to connect with you, so hit us up on the social medias. Uh, shoot us an email at support at millionaireuniversity.com if you'd like to uh, have any questions answered or maybe you have recommendations of folks to have on the podcast. We'd love to hear it and chat with you. With that being said, Brian Guerin, I'm tuning out. We'll catch you on the next episode of the Millionaire University Podcast. <laughs>